Testing, one, two. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I am Justice Forster. I'm president of CEO Club and a business finance student here at DSU. I would like to thank our CEO members for their efforts and dedication to help bring this event to fruition, and Mark for taking the time out of his schedule to share his wisdom with all of us. So without further ado, will everyone please give a warm welcome to Kwadio Mark Antoine Nyamba. Uh, thank you, Justice. So my name is Long, so I generally go by Mark, which is much easier. And today I will tell you a little bit about my journey in uh, entrepreneurship. Like most of you, I started my journey in academia. I'm actually a USD student, completing my PhD in human factor psychology and a master's in computer science. Now, as I was progressing in my degree and that I was getting closer to the end of my degree, the important questions started creeping in. What do I do next? What do I do after graduation? And I had two options. Option number one, which is what most people do in academia, get a job, either in academia or in the industry. But that's like 40 hours of work per week, and I kind of wanted to chill, you know, chill and make money. So I figured maybe I should create a business. And as you would expect, I actually work, I work more now than I would have if I had just taken the job. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about how to create a business from my perspective. I do not own a successful business. I'm still in the journey of asking the important questions. And I believe that I should approach entrepreneurship, like uh, Michelangelo said, it did not sculpt the David uh, by sculpting the rock, but it removed the parts of the rock that were not part of David. And I believe that to create a business, you need to generate profit. Profit comes from value, and your job is to find that value for your customer. So we talk a little bit about how to find that value. Uh, going back about 2021, two years ago, I was still completing my master's in computer science. I'm graduating in December this year. So I was completing my master's in computer science. And I was thinking, well, I need to do something after graduation. So I started thinking uh, of Greenlight Bionics. That's the name of my startup. And what we do is it's a virtual reality platform for physical therapy. So we thought of something cool. We decided let's build the cool thing. And then we make money and you know we retire young. That's pretty much like Facebook. That's what we wanted to do. Now, when we started working on a cool thing, someone told me, you are all familiar with Catherine Cota. Uh, for those of you who tried the launch lab or fast launch, someone told me you should try fast launch. And when I tried fast launch, I was asked, what if people don't like the technology that you're building? Which is one question that I didn't ask myself because the technology was the questions that are uncomfortable for me to get the answer. Because most of those questions returned as no, which means that my technology was cool, but people were not really interested in buying it. And those questions were, does anybody actually need the technology that you're building? Uh, I realized that as a software engineer, programmers do not like hearing that the thing that they spent so many hours working on is not really needed. Because we're in academia, we're used to doing research for the sake of doing research. Business doesn't work this way. We're doing research for the sake of generating profit. So the first question would be, does anybody actually need what you're working on? And don't ask your parents or your friends if somebody needs it because they're, they're nice. They'll tell you yes, but doesn't mean that somebody actually needs it. The second question was, if somebody needs it, then who needs it the most? because that's where you're going to generate profits. The goal of business is always profits. It's not charity. You're trying to make as much as you can by doing as little effort as possible. So who needs it the most? And then what does it mean to them? One thing that I've learned is that just because I intended this technology to work in a certain way doesn't mean that when encountering my customer, this is what they see in the technology. So they might be intending for it to be used in a completely different way, in which case you will do what we call a pivot. And we'll talk about that later on. So I started asking those questions and uh, wanting to know if I can actually generate profit from it. 
that will mean how much do they actually want it? How much are they willing to pay for it? And there is a simple analogy that uh, a friend of mine, Mike Vetter, who works in Rapid City, told me. He said that when you're dealing with a customer, you have to imagine that uh, the customer's head is on fire and he has a choice between dirty water and clean water. If he has a choice between dirty water and clean water, he will use clean water because he has a choice. If he has a choice between a brick and dirty water, he will use dirty water because he doesn't have much of a choice. That what you want to do is to put yourself in a position where your technology is clean water because you're giving him the best choice of what is available out there. So we decided let's go into this product market fit. We will do customer discovery, uh, for those of you who will be applying for the NSF ICO, the ICO program requires you to have 20 interviews by the end of the program. When I was going through the NSF ICO, I wanted to get 300 interviews. So I actually reached out to 300 people. Of 300 people, I was only able to talk to 76. So if you aim for 20 people, you might not get five. So it's a numbers game. You're going to reach out to as many people as you can. and you will be trying to determine product market fit. So don't forget, it's not about your feelings, it's about how much people want to buy this technology of yours. Now, here we're going to talk about a few challenges and how we dealt with them. The first challenge in customer discovery, from my perspective, was to get an interview, to actually get somebody to sit with you and tell you, yes, I like it, uh, we don't really need any change in our domain. So to get the interview, here are my, are my two paths. Either I will use LinkedIn Premium or I will use Rocket Rich. And again, today I'm not going to be teaching you about customer discovery because I know you already learned that from Catherine. I'm just going to give you how I went through it. So LinkedIn Premium, if you go on LinkedIn Premium, you will have something that they call in-mail that you can use to directly talk to somebody who is in a high position that you might otherwise never get a chance to talk to. So I will use LinkedIn Premium, reach out to them. Don't hesitate to do name dropping. For instance, I would say, hi, I'm a doctoral student working with the NSF because, well, I was in NSF ICOR, so it's not a lie. And if they go and reach out to the NSF, the ICOR program would tell them, yeah, he's working with the NSF. That was a simple trick. So I'll tell them, hey, I'm a doctoral student, I'm working with the NSF, and we're interested in that domain that we're working on. I'm reaching out to you because I've heard that you are one of the most competent in that field, and I would like to know your feedback on this issue, or I would like to explore these issues. And people generally respond positively to that when they hear NSF. So Rocket Reach is a different platform. It's a stalking platform platform, for lack of a better term, what they do is they take a contact from LinkedIn and they find the email address and cell phone number. I use RocketRish quite a few times just to get the conversation started. When you get past the awkwardness of the first contact, like, hey, how did you get my number? Oh, I don't know. Then you can start the conversation using the same thing. I work with the NSF. Uh, I'm interested in the issues that you're facing. Then you get to learn more about them. When I will stand with the LinkedIn Premium or with Rocket Reach, once you send, uh, you have the contacts, you're ready to reach out to them, I will generally use a warning email. So let's say, for instance, I want to reach out to you over there. I want to reach out to you. First, I'm going to send you an email. I already have your cell phone number, but I want to call you right away. I'll send you a warning email. The email will say, hey, my name is Mark. I work with the NSF. I'm interested in this or that issue. And I would like to call you in three days to talk about this or that. Now, most of the time, because a person is not part of your university or because your email will be flagged as scam, the person will not receive that email in their inbox. It's very rare that they do. But when I call you three days from now and I tell you, hey, I actually sent you an email, and you think, really, I didn't get any email. And you say, oh, you should probably check your spam folder. And then they see the email, then they're like, oh, yes, it did reach out to me. That's integrity. It's honesty. So then they feel more comfortable talking to you. But when I will start talking to them on the phone, I stick it to <laughs> 2 minutes and 33 seconds. Now, it's a very specific number, 2 minutes and 33 seconds. Uh, the reason why is uh, psychologists have found that people 
respond negatively to generic terms. So if I say, hey, let me have a five minute call with you. Uh, but if I say, let me have a two minutes and 33 seconds call with you and that I stick to it, then you think, okay, he has very specific questions to ask me. And when I start the call, I'll tell you, we have already burned through 30 seconds. So we only have like two minutes left. So let me just introduce who I am and what I'm interested in. The purpose of this call is not really to question the person, but to make them comfortable with having a chain of conversation with me through emails. Once we go past the first call, then I'm going to schedule an introductory email. They'll send them an email, we do Zoom conversation, whatever works for them. A few times we were able to have actually in-person conversations. And using the same strategy going from LinkedIn Premium, uh, reaching out to the person, doing the warning email, the first call, and this and that, I was actually able to talk to people in very, I would say, high stages within the Air Force, which was the domain that I was interested in. And that blew my mind because I never would have otherwise had a chance to talk to them. So just, it's not a trick, it's not a psychology trick, it's just a simple protocol to get people to, to give you their attention, which is what you will need for your first interview. Now, no <laughs> means find a real problem. Uh, we say that because most of the time when you would be trying to understand what are the issues of the customer, you will realize that, well, you are not really part of that domain. So let's say I'm building a technology to help farmers, but I'm a software engineer. I'm not a farmer. Most likely my uh, assumptions about what farmers need are going to be wrong. So when the farmer tells you, okay, here are my issues, here's the top five issues that I'm dealing with, uh, it would be really cool if this could be done and this could be done, and that you realize that what you were working on does not fit into it, don't be offended, don't think, oh man, I wasted my time. No, what you need to think is, okay, here's what I have. It doesn't know about it, but here's what it needs. How do I change what I have into what it needs? And what you find is that most businesses, they say that's, uh, nine out of 10 businesses will fail because of all of these reasons. But the most important reason would be that there is no market need, which means they just built it, they didn't try to have the opinion of the users, and then they just run with it. That's a waste of money. So you will do what we call pivoting. So I go, I talk to the physical therapist because that's what I was working on, physical therapist within the Air Force, I get some feedback and I realize that, okay, what I have could work, but that's not really in the agenda. So then I find myself with the question, okay, there is a market need because the pilots, they are on board, the physical therapists are on board, but the higher ups in the Air Force are not on board and they are the ones financing it. So if you push through it, then you will build something that nobody wants to buy because even if they do want to buy, they do not have the authority to buy it. So what do I do? Do I abort the project or do I change direction to try and find something better, to try to find uh, a segment that I can fit in, which is what we call pivoting. So in pivoting, I'm just going to reevaluate my value proposition. They say you don't fire the team, you fire the idea. It doesn't mean that you have a bad idea, but in the current context, your idea wouldn't work. It wouldn't generate profit. So what I did then is I started looking, because physical therapists and the pilots were interested in it, I started asking, okay, what if I look at it as if it's not physical therapists and pilots, but rather physical therapists and the patients, and then see if that angle works better for me. So I expanded to not just talk to physical therapists within the Air Force, but to also those outside of the Air Force, and then try to talk to the patients and see if that's an idea that they would be interested in. And as we did that, I realized go no go means do I go through with it or do I just shut down the project? Fortunately, I didn't have to shut down the project because I could uh, garner enough interest that even outside of the Air Force, the project would be able to work. I just started to twist it. And so the unexpected destination is where we are right now. We had to turn our platform from being a simple virtual reality platform to being a business to business platform. So what we'll be doing right now as the service stands is we create the virtual reality games. Those are interactive virtual reality games. We also uh, 
builds our hardware, which is a myoelectric controller. So it samples the electrical activity from the muscles and turn it into virtual reality inputs. And so the physical therapists are the ones that we interact with. Uh, they get to access the platform for free and then they recommend the platform to the clients. And the clients will be pretty much doing the physical therapy session on her platform under the watchful eye of the physical therapist. And we reduce the cost of the therapy from $200 per session to about $100 per month as subscription. And the patients that we talked to, they were on board with it. The physical therapists were on board with it. So now we're testing our, uh, we're validating our business model as we speak. But again, like I said, we have pivoted from this business about four times now. So I don't think that, okay, we are here now. This is set. This is what it's going to be. We're still exploring. I'm still performing customer discovery. I'm still expecting to face obstacles. And if I face a major hurdle that I have to change direction to go to something that is more profitable, then I'll be open to do it. Because that's the only way to make your business successful. You cannot force it upon the customers. You just have to have the customers want it. So this actually marks the end of my talk. And if any of you has any question, please go ahead and ask your questions. Thank you. So with your company, have you like developed the whole product yet or because you're still pivoting around, is it just like a theory? Uh, we developed the phase, I would say phase one. So we did a proof of concept. Instead of developing the entire thing that will be hosted on a server, on clouds, we just hosted it on a computer. So people can just test it, yeah. But uh, I would say when we first started, uh, Ideally, I would have wanted to know more about what the customers want before developing the technology. But the thing is, we were already developing the hardware before we even went through fast launch. So it was a little bit late when we started. Yeah. You talked in your talk about how your business has pivoted at least four different times now. What different pivots were those? Like, what obstacles did you hit and why did you choose to pivot? All right. Uh, so when we started, the technology we wanted to get into gaming uh, it was supposed to be an alternative to virtual reality controllers and so we had a talk with uh, steam they're supposed to be a big deal in video games and they told us that what they needed was to have an api fully developed and we did the assessment and that would cost us about two hundred thousand just to develop it have it hosted on a server and then present what steam was wanting from us now we're students, we're broke, we don't have 200,000. So that was the first reason why we pivoted. The second one, we went through physical therapy, but for people with amputation. We didn't actually look for this market. We had somebody, we knew somebody with an amputation. We said, oh, this would be cool if we could do this. So we said, okay, we want money. Uh, we went with it, uh, we walked through it, and we realized that it's not a good alternative to mirror therapy. People are already doing this with simple mirrors. Why would they spend that much money just to do the same thing? So we pivoted again. This time we had somebody we, uh, uh, with a contact with the Air Force. And uh, you might have uh, met Jason Combs before. But he told us, okay, this could work if we uh, implement it in such a way. So we will have to add some posture detection using the VR headset. And this was within our skills. So we did exactly that. We modified the proof of concept again, and then we went and we presented to um, the optimize the human weapon system of the Air Force. And they saw it, and they said, that's good, but that's not really what we need right now. What we need is for somebody to redesign the seat of the F-16 fighter jet. I am not a mechanical engineer, so I was not going to steer my business to such an extent that is out of my skill set. So we just had to look for something else. So we went back and then now we found something where both sides seem to be interested, the both sides of the transaction. So that's what we're testing right now. Okay. Yeah. 
what do you think is like the easiest area to mess up when somebody's trying to start a business? The easiest area to mess up. Uh, I would say your value proposition. Uh, the there's this analogy between the right way and the correct way to start a business. The right way is you go to school, you get a degree in something that you're passionate about, you get some new skills, you think I could do something crazy with those skills and then create a business with it. So you do it and then you start looking for a problem to solve with your business. That's what I did. That's what most people do. The correct way is I see a problem, then I go to school to get the skills that can solve this problem. Then I'm assured to have a business. If you can do it the correct way, you are sure to get customers. Unfortunately, most people don't really go this way. We do it the right way. Yeah. So I would say your value proposition, if you can find this problem early on and then go and get the skills to solve this problem, then you're sure to have customers. Otherwise, you just have to pivot as many times as you need to get to something. So um, to get back to you talking about pivoting, um, are there things that you found from your previous projects before pivoting that are very important to your current product now? Absolutely, yes. Uh, with, every, with every new market, we had to do many iterations. And building a technology is also based on creativity. There are new things that we hadn't thought about before, that we had it now, and when we compare it to what we want to do, we're like, oh yeah, that's a very good addition. So you don't discard things. There are maybe some things that would be less important for the new market, but an addition is generally beneficial. As long as you're not taking away from uh, what the user now needs, I don't think the user will complain about having a bonus. Yeah. Thanks. Um, like you said, uh, we could first find a solution to a problem or find a problem we want to solve, then go get the skills to solve it, etc. So what if you find a problem and then in your course of studying, someone else developed a better solution? Something like that. That's a good question. I will bring you back to that slide. Uh, you see the thing on top with the shark and the people racing? Yeah, it's always a race. Uh, you need to get to market before the other guy. Uh, unfortunately, you are never so special that you are the only one with the idea. I've met enough people with the same idea as what I'm working on. So we smile to each other and we shake hands, but I'm definitely trying to beat them. Yeah. You just have to be faster than the rest. When talking with people to see if you have a viable market, what tactics did you use to really get the best from your interactions with people? I would say honesty. Um, most people don't know what customer discovery is. And if they see you poking around, they are kind of wondering, what is he doing? So what I would say, when I start the conversation, I would tell them, hey, so I'm doing that thing that we call customer discovery. I'm building a business, but I need to know what your problems are before I can build something that can solve your issues. But I can't tell you what I'm working on because then it's going to compromise your opinion. So just tell me what you're facing. That's generally how I open the conversation. Yeah. Um, how do you go about finding a problem? Is it just something you encounter or is there a way that you can go out and like seek out problems? Uh, if I'm talking about seeking out problem, generally if you go on the websites for those services like NSF, uh, NIH, uh, the SBIR website, they always have topics that 
that the government is passionate about. I would say that's the easiest way to find a problem that will be funded. Uh, otherwise, if you, let's say you live in South Dakota, agriculture is a big business in South Dakota. You talk to a few farmers, you find out, okay, this is a big issue. They need somebody to solve it. I might have the skills to solve it. Then you go about it. Yeah. But otherwise, I would say go through federal granting agencies. Yeah. So what advice would you give to young people, college students who think, well, I, I've got an idea, I've got a problem to solve, but I just don't know where to start. So what, how did you take that first step? Uh, so I'll say your first step is to talk to the customer. So if you haven't tried Launch Lab or Fast Launch, that's the short program, you go in it, you learn about business, you get the first business terms, try NSF ICOR, it's the same customer discovery, you talk to the people, you will need uh, an entrepreneurial lead, you need a team, that's for starters, you don't build a business by yourself, it's just too much work for one person. So you need somebody to take care of the business side, you need somebody to take care of the technology side. Now, there's sometimes issue when you have to pivot because you started while somebody's already working on the technology and now you find out that you need to change direction. And the people working on the technology are not always happy about that because they did put work into it. A good advice that I got from a mentor was take them out to dinner, give them something to eat, and then you give them the bad news, we need to change direction. It generally comes easily if you do that. But my advice would be, uh, if you have an idea right now, the first thing you can do is to determine the viability of your idea before you even start working on developing uh, something. Because otherwise you could just be spending 40 hours of work and just find out somebody already did it or there's another better way of solving that same problem. So start with customer discovery. What would you say are some of your daily habits that you do as a routine every day to ensure that you yourself are running well and you and your business is running well? Uh, so I'm not too messy by habit, I would say. Uh, I come from military background, so I'm used to having a very strict timetable. Uh, try to spend... I try to spend about one hour on my business minimum every day, including weekends. And then if there's a very important task, then I can go for five hours. I'm still a student too. I need to complete my uh, dissertation this semester. So you need to learn how to balance school work with uh, your business work. And again, it's very important to have a team because you cannot carry all of that by yourself. Yeah. I guess one question that I had was, uh, say you've come up with an idea, you're going through the steps on trying to turn that into a functioning business or develop it. Uh, at what point would you decide that maybe if it's something that requires additional input, maybe somebody with more like financial accounting knowledge or different purposes uh, and functions that maybe you yourself cannot handle or juggle everything at once, at what point would you decide that you would want to take on additional uh, individuals involved with your business? So right now we grow the business uh, size as a need this. Uh, we only have six people right now and every single one of them was um, recruited for a specific function. So for instance, let's say if um, I'm not much of a social person, I know that, so I recruited her to take care of that because she is a very social person. Uh, if I'm dealing with something that is closely related to physical therapy, I'm a software engineer. I don't know much about physical therapy. So I have a physical therapist that work with us. Uh, if I encounter something that is more into business, we have a business advisor. So you need to be, uh, it's, it's not even about how far you went into the business. Uh, you need to know yourself, know your limitations. I'm not going to say because I want to be the CEO, suddenly I'm going to put my business hat on and I know how to make financial decisions. That's not true. There are business students who have been doing it for 
six, seven years, they can do that better than you. So you just need to know your limitations. So you talked about how you have different people that know how to do different things. How would you go about, how did you go about recruiting those different aspects to your team to make it the best it could be? Uh, so for this one, I, I have to give credits to the university. Uh, USD has a program called the Track Program, Technology Readiness Acceleration Center. And what they do is just, they just recruit people who have an interest in entrepreneurship. And I know that you have the CEO club here. As the club grows, you will get to interact with more and more people who have the same interest than you do. And if you find yourself, let's say, working on a, a SaaS business, for instance, and that you're a business student and you're looking for somebody with software engineering skills, you wouldn't have any issue finding one. As long as the person already has the same interests, it's very difficult to open a business with somebody that you are acquainted to just because they are your friend, which I wouldn't recommend because that's, a, that's an easy way to lose friends. But if you find somebody who already has this interest in creating a business, then they're already aware that this is going to be a lot of work. Every now and then we might not agree on the direction of the business, but it's the same team. They're going to do their work, you're going to do your work. That's, so try to find something with your, within your university. That's what I recommend. So I guess to kind of cap things off, just uh, from my personal feelings, thank you so much for taking the time to come here. I know we've all been able to learn so much from your experience and especially during Q&A, just to kind of get an idea for everything that came to our minds as far as uh, maybe with thinking about starting a business and maybe not sure like what steps to take or just to be able to kind of build off of your experience and gain your expertise from what you went through to be able to apply that. So thank you so much for coming. And thank you. Everybody, please give Mark a round of applause. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And one final note, if you want to talk with Mark afterwards, he's going to be around for a little while, so feel free to come up and uh, discuss. Have a nice evening, everyone.